Welcome down the rabbit hole, friends. This is part two of our episode two deep dive. So if you didn't see the first part, go back and watch the video prior to this one because we're picking up a little bit into episode two when Michelle Duggar lets us know she decided not to talk to Josh about what happened with him and his sisters and Ashley Madison. Instead, she was just going to talk to somebody else because she realized it would be a lot easier to ignore the problem <laughs> and just focus on praying about it. I don't think I need to talk to Josh. I'm going to talk to our Heavenly Father. Danica Dillon eventually came forward to state that she is one of the women who had an affair with Josh Jugger. It was paid for. It was transactional. And she let us know that her interaction with him was very negative and aggressive. Of course, this was just another layer to the cake that we are baking. The cake made out of shit about Josh Duggar. And trust me, it doesn't taste good. You don't want to swallow any of that. Now, porn star Danica Dillon details her alleged sex with Josh Duggar. Though it was consensual, it more or less felt like I was being raped. Once again, the people that came forward in Ask Me Anythings on Reddit who said that they had worked with Josh or lived around him in D.C. said flat out that Josh was portraying himself as a family man. He was quite egotistical and someone you don't want to be friends with in the office. But everyone was aware that he would leave the office and allegedly go to places like strip joints and clubs and spend his evenings doing likely inappropriate things things. She had sex with Duggar while his wife was pregnant. He had wow. paid her thousands to remain quiet. All the while, Anna was living outside of D.C. I believe she was living in Fort Washington, Maryland. It's a little less expensive to live out there and it's more in the country. They lived in a very isolated home because I'm familiar with the area that they lived in. And she stayed home during the day with her children. While I'm sure Josh was giving her a call and saying, like, I have to work late, I have a meeting. I do believe, and I've said this before, I do believe that Anna enjoyed the benefits of being Josh's wife. It was during this time that we saw her change her appearance. Um, some people have speculated that she had work done on her teeth and even may have had some kind of cosmetic procedures done. You know, she was also enjoying trying to do her best to portray the traditional, beautiful Christian housewife. So now we're finally going to meet some of the people who were maybe like influenced by the Duggars, but are not Duggar family members. These are the other people who were participants in the IBLP, and we're going to talk about how things within this structure really affected them and their families. Surreal. Yeah. This is a lot more than like TikTok selfies. At this point, you know, I've pretty much burned every bridge with my family just by being here, but what Stop. And people need to know what really happened. So first we hear from Lindsay with the pink hair. I really like her. And she tells us about her childhood. She says that when she watched the Duggar show on TV, she was like, hold up. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't even need to see this because this is my life. It. I was introduced to the world of Bill Gothard when I was eight years old. It started actually with my parents attending IBLP seminars. So Lindsay had been going to public school. She was taken out of public school to do homeschooling. She talks about it being in the basement of her home and it would be with like her own brothers and they would be given like pieces of wood <laughs> to fashion together because that was like the lesson for today was like how to create some kind of a ramp for a car to go down. And she was like, I could really see the difference in the schooling I had in public school versus the crap I was getting in this homeschool education. I would for desks. I was like, what is this honky tonk situation going on here? Floyd and Tara are featured in this documentary and they have a similar story to Lindsay. They're like, we were pulled out and homeschooled as well. And we knew of the Duggars. We saw them at many conferences. They were always speaking at the conferences and becoming extra popular. My parents decided to homeschool. I know that they wanted to have a hand in what kind of education we got. When we first met, when he said he was homeschooled, 
you could have knocked me over. I'm like, oh, then he definitely understands why I'm such a weirdo. <laughs> Laura pops in and she tells us that the Duggars, like the way that they were so meek and mild on the show, um, it was like an accurate reflection of what she was expected to be in her own home. One of the things that I noticed when I first started watching the Duggars, everyone is very meek and mild. Had you put a video camera on my family as children, you would have seen us the same way. Chad is kind of a reminder that a lot of people who entered the IBLP, they were coming from sometimes like desperate situations. His family was very poor. They lived out in the backwoods. And one of the reasons why they entered the IBLP in the first place is because there weren't a lot of job opportunities. And his father was offered kind of like a pastorship to work as a leader within the church and therefore like be a part of the IBLP. And he was like, heck yeah, I need this job. And this is a part of how his family got pulled into all of it. My parents lived in the backwoods of Walker County, Alabama. There were very few options for them. You either worked in a coal mine, you worked at a steel mill, or you just starved. When my dad had the opportunity to become a pastor, especially in a movement that was supposed to stand up in the last days, well, yes, of course he went for it. I'm there are several other people who are featured in the documentary who were part of the IBLP. And what's so interesting about many of them is that a lot of them come forward and they say, look, there were like these traumatic experiences in the lives of my parents. Like maybe my mom had a really traumatic childhood and she didn't know how to be a mom. She was like looking for a mentor. She was looking for help. She was looking for guidance. And she found the church and the IBLP. And it's like, they're handing you this information, these wisdom booklets, and they're telling you like, this is the one tried and true way that you can raise your children to be productive members of society, to be good people. My mother's childhood was very, very traumatic. A lot of abuse happened. IBLP offered her solace and promised her peace. And, and this is the only way that's gonna work. So when someone comes to this situation already out of desperation, it can be like a lot easier to manipulate them and take advantage of them. In a safe space and she bought all in. She had been going to Bill Gothard seminars from the time the basic seminar became a thing. Bill Gothard was traveling around playing to huge coliseums of people and he's doing one every single week documentary focuses on what's going on with Bill Gothard, the leader and the creator of the IBLP. Guess what? This is what's happening. He is like taking off like a rocket. He's become really popular. He's speaking at conferences full of thousands of people in auditoriums, and he's become very famous among people who are looking for some kind of Christian guidance to raising their families. IBLP spread through my church when I was a kid. The Gothard Market is church to people. They were to leave their seminar, go back to their home churches, be influences for that program. And they kind of talk about how the IBLP, it's to me sort of sounds like an MLM type of model where once these people have been trained, they've come to a conference, they are told like, this is a good path for you to take and they buy into it. Then the IBLP trains them to go home and train others and bring them back to the conferences and spread the information and the doctrine like wildfire throughout the United States. One of the interesting things about Bill Gothard's tactics is that he didn't have like one centralized church. Like I said, it's kind of like a multi-level marketing scheme pyramid where, um, you know, he is, he does end up locating himself in a headquarters type area. But what he does is he trains people and then sends them out all throughout the United States. We also find out like he has no certification. He's not even a pastor. <laughs> this is just something that he made up out of his head and created. Um, and, you know, but it's taken off. It's spreading like wildfire, like wildfire. Gothard was heavily dedicated to the idea that there were um umbrellas of protection in our lives. And we need to stay under each umbrella above us. The top umbrella being God, next down being our father, and it goes down the line, respectively. Like a triangle. One of us has umbrellas of protection. If we get out from under that umbrella, 
we expose ourselves to the realm and the power of Satan's control. Okay, this is an aside that isn't talked about in the documentary, but um, Ginger pops up in one of the scenes in the documentary in the documentary, and it reminds me about how you must always obey your chain of command. It reminds me about how when Ginger talks about like the concepts of authority and the umbrellas of authority, when uh, she put out her latest book, one thing that she um, conveys to us is like how much anxiety, horrible, awful anxiety this caused her throughout her childhood and her early adulthood before she started changing the way that she thought about certain things, that she was constantly scared. And she really felt like she was almost told like if she did something wrong, she was going to be punished by God. And so she was constantly looking around her and seeing things happening and being unsure if it was like maybe a punishment for her or was it a sign from God that she was supposed to do something a certain way? How would she know? What? How could she? Just the anxiety that this girl felt that came out of this structure guilt Bill Gothard had created. Um, I think that it's something that many girls within the IBLP have come forward and stated was a real issue for them. And that included wives obeying their husbands. If you're under your umbrella of authority, nothing bad can happen to you. There's a pastor who's featured in the documentary, and he makes the argument that Gothard was basically being like, hey, we can all go back in time and take our kids to this like mythical Disneyland where we can live like people used to live when things were better and more simple. But the pastor asks, like, better for who? And that's like a great, <laughs> that's a great question. It's just really hit me when he says better for who it's like Gothard was selling was sort of this mythical idea of returning to a time in which things were better better for who you know it wasn't better for the women who were being abused by their husbands was it really better for people of different colors was it better for women who were um, subjugated you know was it really a better time for anyone except the dominant white man in the family potentially um so this was something that you know gets brought up like perhaps some of the men who were so sucked in to this doctrine had a need that they wanted to be fulfilled that they weren't getting fulfilled in regular society of being in charge being in control being special being um the head of something and it could really appeal to someone who maybe didn't have like an advanced career and wasn't feeling like a winner in other ways in their life. Then we hear from Jill Duggar about attending ATI conferences. At the time they only had one conference a year. People who were in ATI I felt like were very concerned about um, which were the conferences hosted by the IBLP for families. And she talks a lot about how a big part of going to these conferences is that they would talk extensively about how to homeschool your child. And people who attended were very against using traditional school, using public school. Any kind of public education for their kids because their kids would get brainwashed, which is true, like that, that those things can happen. I find it interesting because I, I do see how the director of the documentary is trying to make us aware that even the people we're hearing from in this documentary, like, we have to take everything with a grain of salt. And that's true with Jill as well, who I absolutely love. So, like, for example, when she talks about public school, she's like, people were afraid that their kids would get brainwashed in public school. And, you know, like, that's true. That does happen. You know, some people do believe that. And other people would say, like, that's crazy crazy. You know, that's too conservative, Jill. Like, what's going on with you? So, I mean, the doc I like that the documentarian wants us to understand that the people in this show are not like the highest level of authority on knowing everything about what's going on with the IBLP. And we really have to do our own like specific research, come to our own conclusions. You know, Jill and also the Holtz, they're still going to have certain beliefs that may not mesh with other people's beliefs. I mean, we should all know that anyway, right? Well, the purpose of the Advanced Training Institute is to train up young men and women to become leaders of the next century. Young people need a role model, someone to look up to. 
I think it's gross that we hear Josh doing a voiceover on um, the 19 Kids and Counting show about attending like an ATI conference and how they train him to be like the next leader of the next generation. And of course, this was great publicity for the ATI camps. And people have said that the Duggars really helped bring more money, people paying to attend these conferences and camps through the use of their show. 20 years ago, 102 families gathered together in the North Woods and began ATI. For 10 years, we met to write the material, 3,000 pages of the wisdom booklets. The wisdom booklets, the fundamental building blocks of our entire education. A huge chunk of the rest of the documentary focuses on the homeschooling that the IBLP um, structures for these families. And essentially, it talks about how it's just not on par with what you would get in like a public school setting or a private school setting. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, there's lots of videos who've gone extensively into talking about the wisdom booklets. But essentially, Bill Gothard created these wisdom booklets, which were to be read and memorized about different facets of life. They often didn't include essential skills that people needed to learn. For example, Jed Duggar <laughs> made a YouTube video in which while his wife is giving birth, he's an adult, he looks up at the analog clock on the wall and he's not able to read it. And he says, I never learned how to read a clock, so I need my wife to tell me what time it is. Um, so, you know, things like that. And I'm, I'm not, let me just put it out there. I'm not knocking this. My kid had to stay home. I got to put out there. My kid had to stay home for two years during COVID because we live abroad. And I forgot to teach her how to read a clock. <laughs> I was homeschooling her. I had no choice. Um, we were living in Mexico. School was on TV. Um, that was the option. So I was like homeschooling her. And that was something. I mean, whatever. The point being that, you know, they're saying like some of these kids feel that they didn't get the best opportunity <laughs> at an education. Neither did my daughter. <laughs> it wasn't because I didn't want her to go to school. But anyway, um, you know, they didn't get the best opportunity at an education. And now that they're adults, they look back on it like with a lot of frustration and they wish it would have been different for them. Okay, so once they get through a lot of really specific stuff about the wisdom booklets, which I'm not going to go into, they get into my favorite part, which is talking about Cabbage Patch dolls. I've asked Jill about the Cabbage Patch thing, and I, I don't remember if I fully understood. I don't know if I fully ever understood. We never allowed to have them, so. <laughs> oh my God, so Gothard believed like Cabbage Patch dolls were evil. <laughs> But okay, does anybody remember this game? I've been looking for it forever. When I was a kid in the 80s, they had this Cabbage Patch doll game where it was like a big cabbage. It's like a big plastic green cabbage and it spun around in a circle. And as it would spin, little babies, little plastic Cabbage Patch doll babies would pop out and you're supposed to grab them real quick and whoever grabs the most wins or something like that and the babies were freaky and cool and i i loved it because it's like a you get this like pop feeling of pulling them out of the cabbage patch and i just thought that was like oh my god the 80s had the best stuff the best toys i'm gonna do a series about 80s toys for sure let me know if you know about the cabbage patch doll game and where can i get one <laughs> If you see one at a Goodwill somewhere, I don't care where it is, let me know. I'm flying in to pick it up. Gothard taught that Xavier Roberts, the creator of Cabbage Patch Dolls, was a warlock. Then Tia Levings, who's one of my favorite creators, you can catch her on Facebook. I'm so glad she was included in this documentary. She talks about how the voice of Michelle Duggar and um, Anna, and we all know about Priscilla Waller's voice. I made a video about her. She's Anna's sister. Um, the voice is something that T. Levings says is trained into the women in the IBLP. It's something that they're told to do specifically and they have to learn it. And it's about being meek and mild and approaching your husband in a way in which he can best receive the words you have to say to him. This is a very intentional trained thing. It's part of what we were instructed to do. One of the girls on the documentary talks about working with Bill Goff 
Bill Gothard and being approached by him and told that she wasn't wearing her hair appropriately because it wasn't curly and high enough. And he had a book specifically as part of the wisdom booklets that showed like the certain hairstyle that is highly preferred for women. And it was like big, high and curly. At one point, Bill Gothard, he took me aside because he seemed frustrated that my hair wasn't curly enough that it just, it needed more godly oomph. My dad likes long hair. And the documentary goes on to show us how the wisdom booklets specifically target the way that females dress, the way that they look at women, the way that they do their hair, everything about them is targeted within the booklets, how it should be and how they should act. And a big part of what the Duggars were doing on screen is trying to follow a lot of the established have older brothers change girl babies because if you have an older brother change a girl baby like he'll know what female anatomy looks like and he'll be tempted to touch it. I think where this really becomes problematic and the documentary points it out is there were instructions in the wisdom booklets such as never have an older brother change a younger sister's diaper because that's dangerous. You don't know what that would tempt this boy to do. So it's already setting up that this is like normal or natural for boys to have these like inappropriate feelings towards younger girls. And it's up to us to prevent them from putting them in a situation where they would act on those feelings. It's not about like addressing the feelings or trying to figure out what's going on. It's all set up in these rules that the mother and the people who are running the family need to protect their boys from getting into these situations in the first place. The one way that Amy Duggar really does like participate well in this episode, because a lot of other times it's kind of a joke that Amy's sort of like, I don't even really know my family anymore. They don't talk to me. <laughs> but one thing that she does say about like growing up with them that I thought was really funny is that at one point, something came out through the IBLP that like Disney was evil and awful. So she says the whole family had a big bonfire, which her and her family participated in where they like burned everything. So my family had a huge bonfire where they burned everything Disney and everything, everything, literally everything that was worldly. Okay, this was something I had never heard before. I guess I'm out of the... Um I'm out of it when it comes to this information, but apparently Gothard had a whole scenario in which he mapped out this idea that everybody possesses a specific spiritual gift and you will fall into one of like six categories. And each of those categories, like if you belong to that category, you should be treated a certain way or you should expect, it's basically almost like an astrology <laughs> chart to me. That's what I was thinking. Like, are you Virgo? Are you Gemini? Instead, it's like, are you a prophet? Are you a mercy? Are you a teacher? Are you a giver? And one thing that's emphasized on the documentary is that people who fall under the category of prophet are supposed to be like, they might be like egotistical. They go out and show the world. They're outgoing. And the people that are talking in the documentary say that prophets basically get the leeway to be as big of a jerk as they want to be. But then the opposite of the prophet is the mercy. And if you fall into the mercy category, you're supposed to really be the kind of person that props up the prophet and takes care of them. And then they say that essentially all the prophets are male and all the mercies are female. <laughs> so that's sort of how it all falls into place. It is a lot like astrology to me, only made to specifically like propagate the idea that Bill Gothard should be taken care of at all times. <laughs> Every single one of us will see life through our particular spiritual gift. You were taught you had a spiritual gift and you were supposed to Jen from Fundy Fridays breaks in and she does a great job of explaining to everyone how one of the biggest issues with the IBLP is the idea of parentification. There's a lot of parentification in the Quiverful movement. Just the sheer number of children, it is impossible to parent all of them. And they usually have the older children, the daughters, take care of the younger kids. So basically what was happening is that these families were having so many children, it was impossible for the parents, just the two parents, to give each child like all of the attention and love that they needed, but also just to provide like the daily necessities of the kids. So part of the whole structure that the IBLP 
um, supported was that you would teach the older children to take care of and eventually kind of like end up parenting a lot of the younger kids, especially in these much bigger families like the Duggars. And we really saw this on the show, the way that they used buddy systems and the older kids were often taking on a lot of responsibility while mom was frequently pregnant. And for you guys that aren't aware, um, I did another, I looked at another AMA where I did a video how um, talking about how people who had stayed with the Duggars, friends of the family who stayed with the Duggars over the period of time when they were living in their old house and then moved to their new house. They said um, that allegedly Michelle Duggar was like, really had a lot of lower back problems and she would be like very out of it during her pregnancies. She had to sleep in a recliner instead of sleeping in her bed. I mean, I remember having these issues during my two pregnancies. I can't imagine 19. So your whole entire effing life, like you're pregnant, you're having lower back issues, you're uncomfortable, it's difficult to get a lot around, walk around. Um, and so they were saying that Michelle herself, like sh how would she be able to do all of this like one-on-one -on -one parenting with all of these children? She was nauseous, she wasn't feeling well, she wasn't in the best of shape. Um, and, you know, they needed the older kids to step up and take on some of these responsibilities for them. It was not an easy life. I don't, I certainly don't like admire what Michelle Duggar went through. And even, I mean, what Jim Bob, now we know we haven't seen Jim Bob be super involved with the parenting, but I just think that to live that way where you're constantly having another child, constantly having a new baby, like bringing them into the world, um, that seems like a lot of work, a lot of effort. Maybe that was Michelle's way almost of getting out of having to do so much work to be pregnant so that she could say like, I need some time to like sit on the couch and take a, take a breath. I can't spend all my time um, homeschooling these kids. Jill's going to have to homeschool them. I'm pregnant again. You know, I mean, it's, it's terrible to think about, but I, I don't admire like that kind of life for so many years being pregnant over and over and over. I want to tell you, Jason, you know, that Dad is not pleased with the way you've, you've acted today. And you know it's wrong, right? And so uh, I'm going to spank you. So lean over here right now. Towards the end of the documentary, I know this has been going on for a long time, but I just want to address that they talk about the corporal punishment aspect of the IBLP. And we all know that there were books that people in the IBLP use, including the Duggars, which um, talked about using corporal punishment with your children and that this was like the best way to raise your kids. If you're not aware of blanket training, there's all kinds of videos which have been done about it, but the Duggars have been, have allegedly used blanket training with their kids. Um, and essentially, a lot of people feel that it's wrong to use any kind of corporal punishment with children. Not everybody feels that way. We get it. But many people um, who are speaking out in this documentary, you know, they're saying, like, not only did the IBLP, like, teach corporal punishment and, you know, teach parents to incorporate it into their lifestyle, but because all these families live so far away, different areas of the United States and we're all so separated, many of us were so isolated, a lot of times the punishment would get out of control. It wasn't being controlled or mandated in a certain way by the church. So there were families that were, you know, potentially really abusing their children. And they felt that what they were doing was being sanctioned by their church. Scream at us, she would threaten us, she would beat us mercilessly. At one point, she beat me for an entire hour in a church bathroom in an effort to break my will. And I just have to wonder, like when we hear from one of these guys that was part of the IBLP and he says I was horribly physically abused by my mother, I have to wonder if something that contributes to this kind of ABUSE is that, you know, people like this guy's mom, they see families like the Duggars and their kids are all so well behaved and doing such an amazing job and being very meek and mild, especially on TV and everything looks perfect. And they're looking at their kids and they're like, I've got to find a way to get these crazy children under control. Everyone else can do it. Everyone else is fine. Look at this family. They're doing great. We want to be like that. And when they have this kind of example put in front of them and they feel like a failure, all the anger and frustration is coming out. And sometimes it's coming out in a form of physical abuse against their children. So that's one of the ways in which the show was like insidiously participating 
in negatively contributing to the lives of other kids in the IBLP. I hear my uncle in the background go, so who wants to be Josh and Anna's chaperone? So the end of episode two is the most interesting and like critical part of this documentary so far for me because they take a look at Anna's marriage to Josh Duggar, um, the whole courtship mentality. And several people from the IBLP come forward to say like courtship is really like an arranged marriage. What is this CD? Jim Bob is giving it to Josh. Definition of normal sexual inter... Yes. <laughs> But the information that really stood out for me was the information provided by Tia Leving. It's supposed to be a Kama Sutra for Christians. <laughs> There's one position in it and uh, instructions on how to give a good hand job and be available at all times. I really love Tia Leving's and she's available on Facebook. You should definitely check her out. She talks about her own marriage. You are not really allowed to say no to who shows up and says they want you. Um, if a man says he wants you, then he's God's man for you. And you have to learn how to adjust your feelings and thoughts around that. So, And her journey through the IBLP as a young wife and mother who was abused by her husband. Dr. Ed Wheaton, love involves close bodily contact and the pleasure of seeing, touching, and enjoying with all the senses. And we're getting this last shot, which should be the last shot in the show, them walking to the hotel room. She says flat out that marriages were arranged, and it was kind of like if someone, if a man comes to you asking to be your husband, then you need to say yes. Like, it's up to them to make the choice, and you need to just kind of conform to whoever ends up choosing you. And that's what she felt happened in her own marriage. For example, if you forget to say yes sir or my lord when you're talking to your husband, then there's a consequence. There's an implement that's agreed upon as part of the contract and domestic discipline contract. There are rules for whether or not you're allowed to cry. She goes on to talk about just living a really difficult and sad life with her husband who was abusive to her. And she talks about how um, there was a contract between her and her husband kind of sponsored by her mentors within the church saying that if she did A, B, C, D behaviors, then she would get these punishments, some of them physical for those behaviors. Things like saying, yes, sir, or responding to him in a respect way at every turn. And that kind of interaction between man and wife is certainly something that we never saw on the TLC Duggar show. Now, maybe the Duggars do it a little bit differently than other families and every family will have their own way of implementing it. But to hear Tia's story, it sounds like this is something that is mentored by many people within the IBLP organization. I found Tia's story, the end of the episode, the end of episode two, to be really haunting and a really important part of the documentary. So if I were to recommend any part of the documentary to, to anybody thus far, it would be to watch the last 20 minutes of the second episode because Tia has a lot of interesting information to share with us. Okay, so that's the end of episode two for me, friends. I will be back very shortly and I hope you'll join me to head down another rabbit hole as we go over episode three of Shiny Happy People.